Um, let's get started. So what this um, talk was motivated by is that I, um, uh, part of what I do for Wolfram is run the, um, the technical services team here in Europe, and we work with customers um, to use the Wolfram technology to solve their specific problems, um, either for them or with them um, in cooperation. And one of the things I feel like I've heard a, a bunch of times in different wording is the idea that uh, companies have uh, thought we need data scientists. So they hire some data scientists. And what they find uh, when they look back a few months later is that they replaced a bunch of statisticians with people who are still doing statistics, but just uh, demanding higher salaries because they're data scientists and they haven't really changed the way they think about their data. So I was sort of motivated by this question, is data science just the new brand for statistics? And when you look at things from the Wolfram Research point of view, which I'm deeply indoctrinated into now, having been with Wolfram Research since 1992, um, the way I see data science is only subtly different worded, but I think uh, hopefully I'll be able to show quite a profound different perspective on it, is that what data science is, is applying the power of computation uh, to data. Now, that sounds a lot like statistics, but when you think about the, the landscape of computation that Wolfram Research has been has been building out and kind of integrating into this sort of single um, computational language, the Wolfram language, uh, you see computation everywhere. Computation is this really broad topic that includes statistics and so it's sort of more modern uh, data science partner of machine learning, but it's also things like classical modeling, it's, uh, it's signal processing and, uh, and all kinds of different domains of data that you can work with from time series to images to audio and, and so on. And, and there are domains of computation that have been built up in very specialized areas like finance or engineering. And then there are very abstract things that come out of the world of mathematics that apply to all of these different kinds of data for different kinds of um, uh, insights or or transformations. And when you've got all of that at your fingertips, the idea is to be able to apply the best of that, whatever helps in, in solving um, uh, the sort of data science problems you have, rather than being trapped in this, um, uh, you know, everything looks like uh, 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 a nail when all you've got is a hammer type thinking. So one of the things that um, we want to do is get away from, um, or at least, it, uh, enlarge the outlook from what a lot of um, in the end data science I see being in practice, which is counting. That uh, when you look at what a lot of data science teams are actually doing on the ground is they are writing a well-crafted SQL select statement to pull some subset of some data out, and then they're doing some counting on it. They're finding the mean, they're finding the maximum, they're making bar charts or pie charts of the data, but they're not really doing much more than adding up rows and columns. And you know, the insights, the interesting insights are, are a level deeper than that. And that's what really we want to extract. So what does computation give us? And I'm gonna go through a few things that I think conceptually um, it, it changes uh, about the way you approach data. The first of those is that it can be used as a way of unlocking a new signal that you can count. So you can still be doing very classic data science operations, but it gives you new things uh, um, uh, to apply that data to. So I've got a couple of, all my examples here are very toy examples. I, I don't want them to be deep or needing much explanation. So this was uh, a project that I did with my daughter a few years ago. She was um, uh, doing English literature and she was asked to write an essay about um, the book, Lord of the Flies. And we started talking about whether computation could give us something new to say other than you know, just talking about how she felt about the book and what the uh, the narrative was saying. So we sat down and we wrote um, this little short piece of code here that uh, takes, um, I've got the whole book here in this, um, in this elided form, and then I'm looking for the positions of the main character name. So I wrote a little function that for a given character name, finds all the positions that it's mentioned in the book and then does a, um, a smooth histogram to add up how off, how frequently um, they are mentioned. And you get this kind of nice, quick one shot overview of where the different characters play their parts in the book that uh, um, uh, the boys are shipwrecked on the island. And, um, uh, and initially, it's all about Jack and Ralph, the, uh, the 
two lead characters in it. But early on, when they're exploring the island, they discover this idea of this beast that they imagine lives on the island. And it becomes very important in the middle of the book because it helps to drive the plot and, and the, uh, the fight between the boys. So we can see that immediately by counting, just doing these counting operations, just finding the words and counting them. You know, classic um, simple data science stuff. But then we started talking about how this was supposed to be English literature and, uh, and we needed some more tools to delve into that. I'm just going to re-evaluate this to, um, uh, to load the book into memory and realize that um, breaking the thing into sentences and looking at the sentiments, the sort of machine learning tool of uh, sentiment analysis to find the probability that um, each sentence is positive or negative. And then in this case, I'm finding the maximal by. So this is the most likely to be a positive sentiment in the book. We're going to have fun on this island. Um, I hope it's not spoiling the book for you to tell you they don't entirely have fun on the island. Um, once we've got this new tool, we've got a new signal to count. So we just did the same kind of thing counting, but now on this new signal where we are going to classify every sentence uh, and I'm going to find a moving average, just counting positive as one, negative as minus one, uh, and then a bit of rescaling and plot it and overlay it on top of the original plot. And we get this completely new signal that actually gives us completely fresh, fresh insights into not just who's appearing in the book, but the style that's going on. So at the beginning, the shipwrecked and it's all a little bit uh, dark and scary. Uh, then they are having fun exploring the island, so the sentence very positive, sentiment's very positive as they meet signs of the beast. Then it becomes neutral. Um, I'm not quite sure why it becomes positive at this stage, but in the end, there's a dark dystopian ending and everything turns out bad for everyone. And that immediately can kind of be mapped to the data just by giving a new signal. Now, this concept that you're looking for ways of unlocking something new to count is a really general one. So I wanted to show a similar thing from a a different project. Um, this one uh, actually is still in the family. This is uh, my wife's work. Uh, she was working for a medical device company at the time doing needle-free injection, shooting drug particles into the skin. And this is a microscope image from her work um, showing the drug particles released. These are polystyrene proxies for the drug particles shot into a medium that represents the skin. And they're trying to understand the physics of the device uh, to target certain sort of um, um, penetration characteristics. Now, images are just one form of sort of locked up data. There's lots of information in there, but um, it's only really easy to understand uh, perceptually and intuitively by looking at it. But we want to be data driven. And so we want to unlock the data that's hidden in this image. Now, when I got involved, she was holding a ruler up to the screen and measuring the, the, the depth uh, by hand. But because we got the, the tool set for doing computation with images, then it's not that difficult to start unlocking countable data in here. So here's a close up of the image. And you know, the first step with image processing typically is clean the image and get rid of all the noise and chaff. Uh, and then um, I wanted to find the coordinates of these points, but we had the problem that a lot of them were overlapping. And so to deal with that, we measured the distance to the edge of the images and then find the maximum of those distances to the edges of the images. And that allows us to find the coordinates of these two separate overlapping blobs. So here's the code to do that. Um, just talking through it quickly here, cleaning up the image by removing small components in black and then in white, uh, finding the distances to the edge, finding the maximum of those and measuring the center of all of those. And now we have some data. So I can put that in and to help us understand whether it's worked or not, I'm using that data to overlay little crosses to show where we've identified the coordinates. But once we've got those coordinate values, we can do all of those classic data science type thing. So here I'm doing almost exactly the same as I did with my first stab on Lord of the Flies is I'm doing a histogram, although in this case, I'm doing histogram in two dimensions. So what we've got is the um, um, the uh, top of the image is the surface of the skin and down the image is getting deeper. Left to right is left to right on the image. And the height of the thing is the number of particles per per millimeter squared of the, of the image. And we can see that uh, we actually end up with a bimodal distribution where there are more points to the sides of the impact zone and fewer in the middle. And then a rapid drop off as you leave the impact zone, but they're all fairly uniformly, uh, have a fairly uniform depth, which is fortunate because that's what she was targeting. Now, the next thing that, uh, that I think computation gives is it helps to be able to bring in other information to give context to the data. It's not, um, 
uh, it's not just the data that you collect that is interesting, it's very often how it relates to the rest of the world. So one of the things that we can do is to, is to inject extra context. And here's the simplest example I can think of for this. This is an API that you can access um, that is a live aggregator for borrower bike systems around the world. So this is the current status as of a few seconds ago of London. Bike stand uh, number one is in Clerkenwell in London, and it's at some latitude and longitude, and it's um, we can see the timestamp here to know how old the information is, and number of bikes, number of free stands, and information like that. Now, of course, Wolfram language makes it a little bit easier to um, uh, to process that. So it's, I'm going to re-import that now as a computable data set, uh, which also gives me slightly better formatting for free. Um, but what do we do with this information? It's all very useful if I want to check what's the current state of, um, oh, I seem to have um, been playing with this. This is Berlin's data. So if I want to see what's the Karlsruhe um, station's current status, that might be all that I need. But very often we're trying to take insights from the whole data, not simply looking up specific values. So one of the obvious things you can do to give uh, data context is to, um, Put use the geo positioning and put it on a map. So, um, um, so this, uh, yes, I, I'm not in London here. I am in Berlin. Uh, here is the uh, layout of Berlin with the bike system, and I've colored the dots according to the um, um, according to the proportion of the stand that is full of bikes. And actually, this is exactly the same behavior that you see uh, I've, when I've studied London over time with this uh, API. As you find that the um, bikes all tend to move into the day uh, into the city during the day and then they tend to be around the peripherals uh, um, as commuters travel back out at the end of the day so our current state here i guess it's uh, what is it about four o'clock in berlin at the moment they're all still in the center of the the city now you know the map is is an external piece of data and context but actually to be able to make use of it even the mere act of putting dots on a map requires computation. I did a project for an oil company with um, uh, cleaning up spilt oil. And it turned out that the data sets we were presented had different coordinate systems that in the UK, we have the Ordnance Survey that is a mapping system that goes back to um, just before the First World War. And it's very high, highly detailed maps, but uses a slightly different grid than the GPS system. And so when you've got data from these multiple coordinate systems, mapping them exactly to the same spot requires geo projection and, uh, um, and these sort of geodesic calculations, while not, not difficult, there's, they're subtle to get right because there's so many different variations on them. And so the ability to overlay these two data sets onto the same grid and not be 50 meters apart, which was a big deal for digging soil out of the ground to clean it up, um, required computation. Um, here's the same kind of thing, trying to do something slightly more sophisticated, because it's not just, we don't want to just take that context of um, neighboring points and place them. We also want to be able to do computation across those kind of relationships. So this is a similar kind of uh, task. There's a blog on blog.wolfen.com that you can read on how to do this one. Uh, which is taking the food hygiene database from the UK. So we have a system where you, uh, every restaurant gets inspected and everywhere that serves food. And you can see here that when I ran this data last, the, the 1738 cafe in Oxford was rated five out of five for hygiene. That's a good thing. And so here's the uh, same kind of thing, throwing them on a, on a map. But being able to compute spatially allows me then to do things like, well, what's the moving average to give the sense of where regionally food hygiene is high or low rather than specifically to the restaurant. And if you ever visit Oxford, the dark area here where the lowest food hygiene is, is the kind of cheap part of town where all the students live. Um, and when I last ran this uh, around the station where the tourists come into town was also relatively low hygiene. And up here where all the uh, multi-million pound houses are is where all the best quality is. And on a national level, if you come to visit the UK, generally avoiding the big cities is the thing uh, for good quality food hygiene. Um, the belt across the London, Birmingham, Manchester is where all the population lives. Odd, odd spot I've never been to explain is South Wales, where there is a persistent hotspot of poor quality in the South of Wales. Now, another thing uh, that computation can give you uh, 
is the ability to change the viewpoint. And this is this is very much a um, human mental block issue that I've seen over and over again is that um, people have collected data on X, whatever X is, sales, sickness, whatever the thing is that they're measuring. And they are locked into the mindset that the data describes that feature X and they end up doing data science that measures X. So they say, what's the biggest X? What's the average X? What's the average X over time? And they're fixated on the thing they're measuring. And very often the, the insight is between the measurements and it's, it's in things that you have to infer. Um, this was another small project. I was doing some work with the, com the group that were trying to break the um, thousand mile an hour um, record for supersonic cars. And fortunately they ran out of funding, so we never got to do the project with them in the end. But the idea was we we're gonna help um, provide educational access to the, uh, to the data that came off the car. But in starting the conversation, they said, here's some data from the um, previous thrust SSC car that uh, does hold the current land speed record from one of its uh, test runs. You know, what might you do with it? Show me something interesting. So I got some data with about 20 different channels and I plotted all kinds of uh, variations of the different channels. Here you can see the um, the black line here is the, the revolutions per minute of I think the front right wheel, which is the best proxy we have for speed because um, speed is actually gets tricky to measure when you hit sort of five or 600 miles an hour because GPS doesn't work quite right and uh, the wheels start to slide. But this was the best kind of measure we have on car for speed. And then I've got uh, suspension load. And you can see immediately just by looking at the measured features, there are some interesting points. We can see when it reached the top speed. Um, we can see a couple of odd spikes and dips in the, the suspension load. Uh, we can see uh, the suspension load showing where it started because nothing's happening on the suspension, then things start happening and where it ends. So there's a few features you can get straight out of the measured characteristics. But things sort of get much more interesting when you um, when you try and change the way that you look at the data. So if we take, for example, that speed data, of course, everyone who's done you know, high school maths knows that uh, you know, in the derivative of speed is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, is acceleration and the derivative of acceleration is the jerk. So you know, I was just immediately curiously thought, does that show us something different? And just taking that numerical derivative, we suddenly see interesting features immediately popping out. So the acceleration is uh, going up in steps, um, then it sort of flat lines, then it tails off, and then we get this massive uh, uh, spike in, in negative acceleration. And that all makes sense when you start throwing in context. And so by being able to bring in other data like the throttle position, you can see actually the all of the steps on the way up are governed by the, the driver who trying to avoid accidentally becoming a pilot is putting his foot down in steps and waiting to see how the car reacts before pressing on with greater velocity. And then you can see that for this period, um, it was at maximum, or at least the maximum for this run throttle. And this is air resistance building up now until it's no longer going faster. And the moment he takes his foot off the throttle and the jet engines cut out, then that's where this massive deceleration comes from. The, um, the suspension load was a bit more interesting though, because um, there you can see it's very noisy. So derivatives are not gonna tell us very, anything very useful. They're gonna be all over the place. Um, maybe a moving average would be useful to start extracting out underlying signals. But I decided to do something slightly different and look at it instead of in time space as measured, uh, um, I wanted to flip that into frequency space. So this is something called a wavelet scalargram using a, a continuous wavelet transform. And the way to read this is we've got time along the bottom and we've got frequency up the side, higher frequencies at the top, lower frequencies at the bottom, and the darker it is, the stronger the signal. And now we get some interesting features popping out that there's some kind of transition here and here, um, very boldly that if you look back at the original data, if you know it's there, you can kind of see actually something is uh, happening a bit odd in that area, but um, but now it's, it's in stark relief and then another feature at the end. And I didn't really know much about the data, I was just, being a data scientist and playing with numbers. And it was only when I got together with their engineers, they said, wow, I've never seen that before. What that is, he said, is that while this was a subsonic run of the car, the top of the wheel goes faster than the car because it's catching up as it, as it rotates around. So the top edge of the wheel is breaking the sound barrier. So the first spike here on the suspension is the vibrations caused by the sound barrier being broken. 
Uh, the second one is the sound barrier being exited as we slow down. And we know it weren't quite sure in the end whether the final two features are the brakes being applied at the end or the parachute being applied at the end um, that is bringing the car to a halt. But both of those is causing a shock event. Uh, and it may be that the two spikes, in fact, are those two di different discrete events that the uh, parachute deploys first and then breaks only when it's doing under 100 miles an hour. Um, and so this sort of playing around with uh, with dimensionality um, and transformations on the data, again, unlocks things that might in the end just be old fashioned data science of counting and plotting to, to present, but actually unlocking those signals is the thing I'm constantly thinking of, how could I unlock something interesting? And another thing to remember is don't, don't always accept the dimensionality you're presented with. So um, time in this case is the, is the independent dimension, but it's things that are sometimes interesting to look at, not from a time perspective, but in this case, I'm plotting the, um, the load on the front wheel against the RPM and applying some smoothing. And the reason why you get two traces is that in time, we're going up one line, but then back down the other because we visit the same speed twice, once when we're accelerating, once when we're decelerating. And interestingly, you can see that the profile is different depending on whether uh, we're on our way up the curve or down the curve. They're substantially different. Um, I think the the um, the mainly lower curve is the return and the upper curve is the, the way out. So that's presumably to do with whether you're under force of the thrusters or simply under um, the force of drag at opposite ends of, you know, applying at opposite ends of the car. Um, but we don't really care here whether this is time and stretch over a long period or whether it was only briefly at this speed, we have a completely different way of lining up the data and presenting it. Now, sometimes um, that kind of shift in dimension combined with a shift in conceptualization um, can completely inject new viewpoints that didn't exist before. Um, and this was another toy example that, that I thought of that I felt illustrated this quite nicely. Uh, this was a little mini project for uh, a bank they had some trading data and they were they were wanting us to add a dashboard element to show the um the the correlations between the different trading assets so here's the idea that we've got these different assets ATHX PFBX these all represent things that you can buy and sell like shares and by looking at the correlations um you can figure out how related the assets are. So a one down the diagonal is because everything is perfectly color, color, correlated to itself. Uh, minus one is it when one goes up, the other goes down. So this is just uh, um, Pearson's correlation coefficient. And they said, oh, we want, to, we want a grid of that and we want you to put a threshold on it so we can see the ones that are highly correlated. So, you know, we did what we were asked. Here's the, those different assets across the portfolio shown uh, with brightness for the, or the redness for the amount of correlation. Um, and then we can apply the threshold according to the button at the top. And we can see for different thresholds, we can pick out the ones that are most highly correlated. But it didn't really feel like it was adding any, other than being able to hone in on which of the highly correlated pairs is not really adding much insight. So the thought that I had was, uh, well, if things are correlated, you can think of them as kind of like a, uh, a relationship. And if we think in terms of relationships, then there's all kinds of um, domain specific mathematics for social network analysis and more abstractly graph theory. So what if we thought about these as a as sort of um, friendships and then we're looking for cliques uh, and graph theory computation gives lots of ways of pulling out things that are at the center of cliques, things that are uh, in groups. So here's that same data now represented um, as a graph community plot. So we can see here that uh, the asset BIOS is highly correlated to the asset Andy. It's not actually highly correlated to the uh, asset WBMD, but collectively this group reaches a threshold of forming a family that uh, appear to be kind of generally correlated to each other. And we end up with four strong families, um, one of which is almost empty, but three populated large families according to certain thresholds. And now we've got something that's much more insightful. It's 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 you can start asking the question what is it these things have in common that they generally move together are they all energy stocks or are they all um, highly indebted or what is the the feature that's making them move together but you know the, the the wider insight than just the immediate connection is much richer than the the superficial of just counting those values so all in all um 
you know, most of those things are about using computation to provide things that you can do data science on. But the last of my insights of what computation gives you is remembering that the computation doesn't have to apply to data. Computation can apply to all kinds of other things like models or, or the output of other computation. And really the real benefit of multi-paradigm isn't just that you can find the right tool for the task. It's that the really interesting problems don't fit one tool at all. And what you want to be able to do is to uh, tackle the richer, bigger problems and extract the, the kind of more hidden insights by chaining tools together to cross these um, disparate domains of computation and treat it as like one whole tool set rather than a set of specific toolboxes. Uh, another toy example here that um, I tried to tackle this for the Wolfen blog many years ago, and I gave up because I was trying to approach it from a signal processing point of view. Um, but it turns out that it's a good example of this um, bringing multiple forms of computation together. Here's the challenge. Hopefully, if I've shared this correctly, you will hear this. So this is the sound of a uh, vehicle uh, with its horn going, I think, driving past us. And the question was, could I make a speed detector that wasn't based on um, radar and uh, cameras, but was based on the sound of the vehicle going past? That there's the reason why the sound goes is because of the Doppler shift. Um, when it's coming towards us, the frequency is raised, and when it's going away, the frequency drops. And is can we use that to detect the velocity of the vehicle? As I said, from a signal processing point of view, it turned out to be quite hard. Um, Mark, uh, Marcus van Almzik and our signal processing team managed it, but um, um, uh, but it was beyond uh, my skill set. Uh, but later on, I revisited it once we had a, a bigger variety of tools, and it suddenly became quite easy. So. Here is, oops, we're going to load the sound first. Uh, here is the sound shown as a spectrogram. So we can see that there is a signal worth pursuing. So this is the same spectrogram I showed before. And you can see the frequency dropping here as the vehicle goes past. But it's going on at lots of different frequencies. So I really want to pull out a frequency that is sort of representative, um, not the low rumble that's barely moving or the high frequencies that are shifting quite a bit. Um, and a later version of Mathematica, um, offered pitch recognition, in this case, backed by a uh, method that is using a, a neural network to recognize uh, frequencies. Now, neural networks could probably solve this on their own, but only if I'd had lots of training samples. If I had hundreds of sounds of vehicles going past with calibrations of what their speed was, then just throwing that into a machine learning classifier would, would work. But I've only got the one sound here. So here I'm using the kind of acquired knowledge of pitch recognition from other contexts, like musical instruments or whatever else this was designed for. And you can see here now that I've got a time series that has um, picked out a single path here that is the, um, the kind of main frequency uh, over time. And it's varying between 370-ish hertz and 330 hertz uh, over the four seconds of the, of the interval. Now, at this point, I go off to Wikipedia and I look up Doppler shift and I find this, this formula. So I've got a formula for Doppler shift, but then I also have to do some geometry. And um, actually, in a version of this, I did it using some of the Wolf language geometric constructs. But in the end, it comes out as this is the geometry of the relative uh, velocity of something that is passing tangentially by. So given that it's traveling horizontally in front of us at a separation of uh, of um, x distance and y distance and is traveling with a certain x velocity, what is the perceived x velocity that you get um, at an angle? So it's a bit of trigonometry here. Now we're in the realms of computer algebra. I've got two algebraic expressions. I've also got a couple of uh, useful values like um, um, the speed of sound, uh, which I don't know what the speed of sound was on the day, but I'm going to assume here um, from a lookup that, it's this, that I'm going to use the speed of sound at sea level. Uh, uh, at a 15 degree centigrade. So I've looked that up and inject that in. And this sort of um, fairly basic computer algebra allows me to pull together uh, these different models and compute uh, a formula for what this curve should look like, which now I can jump into classic statistics and do nonlinear model fitting of my algebraic model to my data that I came, got from the machine learning uh, in order to get the parameters that are unknown that best suit the data. If this has worked, we get now a curve that overlays the data very nicely. Now that we've got the parameters for the curve, 
now we can just pull those parameters out and look at them and we get the things that we're interested in with a little bit of interpretation. The vehicle's actual uh, underlying frequency was 349 hertz, kind of in the middle here, as you'd expect. It passed 5.1 meters away from the observer, was doing 20 meters a second, so about 40 miles an hour, uh, enough for a speed ticket in an urban area. And it passed us two and a half seconds into the, into the, into the sound. So interesting, insightful results at the end, but the reason why I show this example is because I'm touching on things that in, in a more narrow mindset feel like different domains of computation that might need a specialist in a different area. The, we've got signal processing, we've got uh, machine learning, we've got computer algebra, we've got model fitting, uh, and we've got a bit of visualization thrown into boot. Uh, and no one of those things can do anything very useful with the problem. You need them all to join it up. So if I'm right, and if this sort of um, uh, world of uh, computation is much better than uh, you know getting a stats package and and uh, SQL and and doing basic things. Why why don't we see more of it? Well, there's two big answers to that. Um, one is an educational challenge. Um, you have to know about it. And I could talk for an hour on this topic because I'm part of um, the computer-based math project that we run out of uh, the European office with Conrad Wolfram. Um, I would encourage reading his book, The Maths Fix, that tries to rethink what maths education should look like if we assume computers exist. That if we assume you're going to use a computer in the real world to do your maths, then what should you learn to be best equipped for that? Some things that you your, that consume education at the moment are about learning to be a computer, to repeat the computations on pencil and paper. And we want to think about how you could learn to use the computation um, and to understand the concepts better by freeing up some of that mechanics time. And that means gives the opportunity to learn about more math mathematical concepts that are kind of left to undergraduates level study at the moment, which are completely amenable to 12, 13, 14 year olds. They just haven't got the time to look at it and under the current thinking you have to do it by hand so it's too hard to do but it's not too hard with a computer um but the um the other problem a more practical one is that computation can be difficult um and this is really what i think the bulk of the the last 35 years of Wolfram research r d has been about is not just solving interesting algorithmic problems, it's overcoming that issue of can we make it usable by people? And so obviously this is a pitch for why you should be using Wolfram language, but it's also a call to arms that when you write, when you write algorithms, the interesting thing uh, always for people who are kind of algorithmic minded is the algorithm. That's the intellectually demanding part. That's the satisfying bit when you come up with a new way of, uh, of getting that insight from the data. But don't forget the last leg of making those algorithms easy to use by the petite people who, who might um, come after you and want to use what you've done. And you can never underestimate the, the amount of automation you need to apply to make that possible because Sure, it's true that many of the people who use your algorithms are intelligent and could figure out what you've done and uh, and edit the code, but nobody has the time and uh, to be an expert in so many different things that multi-paradigm computation could provide. So we don't underestimate the, how small a barrier makes your work on it, inaccessible to people because they simply either haven't got the educational background or because they simply lack the time and inclination to engage. So a lot of what we need to do is to really focus on automation. Um, and part of that is, is, is making the computation easier. It's partly about just removing the legwork that you have to do. Um, but it's also about trying to automate the, the knowledge, the expertise, the education you need, so that you can, if you can get the concept, you don't need to, need to know the details to be able to use the algorithms. And this is the kind of way that we about it and I would encourage you to emulate. So um, just switching domains here to a machine learning example, this is a classic uh, toy data set for, that is often studied as a playground for writing machine learning algorithms. It's the passenger list of the Titanic. We've got uh, some input data, in this case a first, first class passenger, she was 29 years old uh, and she survived. And our task here is to build a classifier that could predict what would happen if we went back in time and 
I were to travel on it, um, assuming I'm not advantaged by some prior knowledge of what's going to happen. So the first thing here to point out is that the way we try and write things in the Wolfram language is to describe a task, not an algorithm. So if I run this, um, this command classify on the data, and it'll do some machine learning here, there is an algorithm. And the algorithm in this case is gradient boosted trees. But if you write your code to be a function called gradient boosted trees, then you're locking in the algorithm of choice. And here by doing classify, actually classify has about uh, eight or 10 different core uh, machine learning algorithms at its disposal. And it has chosen for itself gradient boosted trees. Uh, it's also figured out some other things that this is uh, a category, a number and a category in the data. So that was the class, the age and the, and the sex of the uh, passenger. And in fact, even within gradient boosted trees, there's three, four, five parameters that it has to uh, choose from about the boosting method and the boosting rate. I, I forget what the choices are for that. And then we get, uh, I'm a little older than that now. So um, I'm a 52 year old male clearly would travel first class. And here's the prediction that it makes that I would have died. And we can see the performance of that uh, for different ages uh, across the model. But the key hit thing here is that I didn't need to know whether gradient boosted trees was an appropriate method or whether it was the best method. The automation has allowed me to be able to use this simply by being able to understand the concept of uh, finding classes from data and be able to read the documentation on the format of data that it expects. But it also means that um, it makes it a lot easier to play around with these things without having to rewrite all the downstream code. So if I wanted to say, um, I know better, I know a little bit about this, I'm going to use, um, instead of gradient boosted trees, I'm going to use naive Bayes as a method. I can recompute everything here without having to rewrite the code. I don't have to say if method, you know, that if the result of the method was this, then you have to call this in a certain way. This classifier function presents a unified interface, despite the fact that the internals have now changed. And this is whatever parameters need to be held for a naive Bayesian method. And, um, and we can see the new result coming out. So we try and do this all over the system. When you use ND solve, you don't have to say whether you're using the Runge cutter method to solve differential equations or the Adams method. You don't have to concern yourself with concepts like is the differential equation stiff or non-stiff to make the decision which method is appropriate. Uh, as much as possible, we try and make the method automatic and the parameters automatic and have some heuristic or of picking that automatically. Of course, you don't want to hide those details. You will have expert users who want to take control. And so the idea of writing things that have methods with the default values, and we can see those uh, options of class CFI, uh, if I can spell it correctly. So here are all of the things that you might take control of. And in fact, there's some that aren't listed here that are sub methods to uh, sub options to method. Um, so our default on all of these things as much as possible is to set them to be automatic and have some kind of automation to do it. But anything here can be overridden by the user. And that's a really great design for your functions that you write that you want to share is to package up those details as much as possible. So you only ask for the things you have to ask for, but you let people provide more information. Now, one of the things that, that this kind of automation also allows you to do is to, is to abstract out concepts a lot further which is really useful for usability. So here's an example that's in a, a sensibly different domain. I'm doing computer vision now, and I've got photographs that I'm classifying into nighttime or daytime. But conceptually, that's exactly the same task. It's still classification. And by putting enough automation into the um, encoding of the inputs, I don't have to create now a uh, computer vision classifier. I can write some code that as my automation, uh, analyzes the input and says, in this case, the input type was image as opposed to the input type in the previous one, which was this nominal numerical nominal. Uh, and now that's allowed it to uh, automatically extract image features from that, which is then applied in this case, logistic regression to those and come up with a classifier function um, that encodes the, the model that we have here. But again, because it's a unified interface, we've automated the conversion of inputs. That classifiers function is the same uh, function as we had before, 
but it's got internally, it's wrapped up some extra information that says I'm expecting an image. And if I don't get an image, then complain. Uh, and now we can apply that to a list of unseen images and we can see that it predicts four of them are nighttime and two of them are daytime and it's done okay. It seems to have got number two wrong. Um, I guess the bright yellow label like a sodium light and generally gray contents of the images made it think it's um, it's nighttime, but other than that, it's done a decent job for many 30 images. But we also, um, this idea of automation is, is something we want to take a step further if we can, which is, uh, and I feel like we're still on the beginning of this, of can we use automation to join up more and more of the stack of technology by bringing together, together more and more different kinds of computation to get to a higher level of abstraction? Maybe one day we'll just say, tell me about my data and it'll just tell me insights, but we're not there yet. Um, to give you a sense of the journey, um, here's some, at first glance, different things that join to make really useful super functions at a high level. Um, we have this machine learning framework that we've built in that's designed primarily for doing things like classification and prediction. But the same machinery can be uh, used to generate synthetic data. So that's what learn distribution does, is it subverts that to build a model that is Design for generating examples. So this is, um, let me show the data here. This is another classic machine learning data set. These are some measurements of flowers, the length of the petals, the length of the stem. I don't know what they represent. I'd have to look that up. And the kind of flower uh, from this Fisher Iris data set that that represents. Now, having done this learned distribution, I can now make random samples from that. So here is a random um, flower sample that. Um, is statistically consistent. So the relationship between the length of the stem and the size of the flower, whatever these numbers, that is a consistent and not an unusual um, combination of values across the four dimensions. Once we've got that, we can go a step further and start thinking, okay, if you can start uh, generating data that's synthetic data, you can then start um, using those relationships to start saying, does this seem like a plausible relationship? We can ask the probability that, um, that we would find something as weird as this set of numbers. So this is the taking the concept of the tail in classical statistics, where you know probably everyone who's done stats at school has done the thing where you fit a normal distribution to the data, and then you say we're going to have some p-value that says if you're far enough down the tail, we're going to call that unusual, and if you're in the top five percent of the tail or two and a half percent of the tail, then we'll declare this uh, statistically significant. Well, tails work fine when you have single mode data, they don't work very well, you've got multimodal, and that becomes even worse when you get start getting really high dimensional multimodal data, there is no such thing as a tail. Um, but this concept of rarer probability uh, takes that concept and says, what's the chances that we're going to get something as weird as this, uh, or worse, and we can see here this is extremely unlikely. If I took the synthetic example and put it in there, we should presumably get something that's uh, um, a little bit larger, a p-value of 0.9 says this is a totally consistent set of values. Once you've got that concept of, is this weird? Well, now we can start saying things like, pick out the things that are weird. And so while telling the story, I've sort of taken you through this stack of functionality. In the end, the first step of data science is very often cleaning up your data. That's all you care about is find the anomalies. So we've packaged that up as an entirely self-contained function that says, um, I want a anomaly detector for um, examples from the M MNIST um, data set. So these are a collection of hand-drawn uh, digits. And we're going to build something that uh, is going to learn from those and make an anomaly detector. And then I'm going to apply that to some data that we've collected from a survey or whatever that we've scanned in. And we can immediately clean up this data and go, oh, for some reason, um, this num this number four here has been really messed up. It's really bad, bad scan or something. It can't be trusted. This doesn't even look like a, um, a number. Maybe somebody's put the wrong piece of paper into the scanner, and this is a little photograph of, uh, of the person rather than the number they wrote down on their form. So this kind of being able to go through and look for things that went wrong is a really general idea of finding anomalies. But um, because we can use that all of that stack of automation, this find anomalies is a really general function. Uh, you know, I can do um, find anomalies of, uh, let's say, um, 
Um, let's make some random uh, numbers from naught to one. Um, we'll have a hundred of those and we will append to that the number 55. And hopefully after a bit of thinking about that, it says 55 is an anomaly. So in this case, I'm using photographs, images. Here I'm using reels. It just works. It's just an abstraction on a really high level concept. And that's, I think, the thing that we want to aim towards is trying to have the most reasonable concepts that are as powerful as possible. And then the, the fact that you're looking at specific data sets is almost like the, the afterthought. Now I've built this great machinery. Now I can apply it to my data set, but by making it packaged up machinery, that becomes powerful to apply to anyone's um, um, data potentially, if done well. And of course, the last thing about automation that we want to do is to actually automate the task of discovery. And here it's worth sort of making the conceptual difference between data science and perhaps data engineering that we want to think about ourselves not as just going through the motions of following some predefined question. Uh, you know, that can be useful. You might say, you know, what is the, uh, you know, what is, you know, is the average of this data set bigger than the average of that data set? You might have a very specific question and you're using the data to answer it. But very often we want to be more scientific uh, in the broadest sense here and say, the data has got something interesting to tell me, but I don't know what it is. Just like when you discover a new species, you don't know what you're going to learn about this new species. You want to prod it and poke it and, and make discoveries from it. And very often, trying to think beyond the obvious questions is, is the scientific process. And there are often very interesting things you can just do to the data without knowing what you're going to get or even what it'll mean. Um, but it, it either presents you with new insights or sometimes just raises questions that you then uh, motivate you to pursue uh, new questions. And very often I just, uh, my first step with data is let's just, uh, you know, throw a bunch of random plots at it, throw a bunch of random, uh, let's look at the correlations between values and are they just no brain of obvious things and, and do things like uh, machine learning uh, uh, feature space plots to see is there some structure here that might be worth investigating. Here's my toy example. Um, this is a classic sort of thing to do is I've taken some random uh, um, pictures from the Stanford Dogs database. And uh, I, this is randomly selected from the database, so this doesn't always work well, but hopefully it'll work well for me now. We're going to take that, and I've thrown away, I do actually have some information on these dogs, I know their species, but I've thrown that information away, and I've imagined I just discovered dogs for the first time, and here's the photographs that my researchers have sent me, and we want to find some something interesting. So this is one of those sort of first steps I often do is let's throw it at feature space plot, which is a machine learning way of uh, trying to find so just general structure in the features that might be discoverable. That's a bit cramped. So let me make that a bit bigger. And here is the result that uh, I had hoped to see. Uh, we've got three clusters forming. So what it's done is it's looked for features uh, in, um, in the images. As a human, we might think of features as the length of the ears and how pointy the nose is. But in a machine learning world, it's looking for features that might be some kind of abstract texture or some kind of uh, combination of corners and lines. And it's totally hard to label. But I don't care. It's looking for interesting features to it. And then I'm squashing that into two features, just which I can use as an X and Y plot. So I'm doing feature reduction to give it its technical name. And then I'm using that X and Y to place them on, on the screen. And what we see here is three clusters have formed. Now, as a human, I can tell straight away, if we look at the images in these clusters, the cluster in the bottom left corner are all Basset hounds. In the bottom right corner, they're all Irish wolfhounds. I uh, can't quite tell with some of them. And in the top left corner, they're all the chihuahuas. So what this has done is it's discovered the notion of dog breeds without having any concept of dog breeds. It, all it's found is there is a clustering that forms naturally under certain collections of features that are extracted. And we might be interested in these ones that aren't really in any that's in between uh, the Basset Hound and the Chihuahua space. And I can't quite see even what that is. The, yeah, I suspect it's because the dogs are too small and it's picking out the features from the person who obviously looks a bit Chihuahua-y, Basset-y and doesn't look very Wolfhound-y. It appears to be a little picture of a, a little girl holding two two dogs that I can't tell what they are. So in this case, I can tell 
what this means. It means dog breeds, but that's because I've chosen it with that answer in mind for demonstration purposes. I've done this uh, with trading data and you get back the same kind of thing that my graph theory did earlier, which is to say, here's some clusters of, of, um, of assets that have something in common of them, some features that make them similar. But again, it doesn't answer the question. It raises questions. What is it that makes them similar? What are these features? Are these features that are, are purely categorical after the event? Or are these features that are predictive that could tell us that this is going to move in some way that's related to other things in the cluster that I could make money out of? It doesn't give me the answer, but it gives me the question. And that I think is, um, is part of the role of computation is to try and do as much um, as much as possible without knowing what you're going to get. And the more automated it is, the more you can do in the time, and you can, the more these kind of random experiments you can do, and sometimes you get those aha moments to, um, to direct your future discoveries. Um, a final thing on automation is that I've been focused here on data science, and I've been kind of trying to push away the idea of data engineering and uh, engineering and, uh, um, and even things like data collection. But one of the things that joining computation up does and automation does is to extend those boundaries a bit. You don't have to say, I'm a data scientist and it's not my job to, uh, to make this research more widely accessible. Well, if we make it easy enough for you, then we want you to be able to do more, more of the roles that otherwise need other kinds of expertise, whether that's technical roles like optimization or machine learning, or whether it's kind of out of the main roles like software engineering. So as an example, things like the automation of the import is part of this. We um, building forms to let you gather data if you want to be able to make your own surveys, those kind of things. At the tail end of it is things like deployment. Um, so we want to be able to set up code uh, so that it's instantly deployable. Now, this is a bit of a more convoluted example than I usually show, but what we can see here is that I've got uh, a georegion value plot of the data set that I was exploring earlier. Uh, so this was the, um, the bikes data import. Uh, but this time I've added a little action menu on here and we've the action menu is automated enough to figure out what it looks like, what uh, how it updates values. And I've told it which bit I want to change according to that by putting this dynamic around it. The rest are all some details about aesthetics, how big, what plot label is, um, and, um, uh, and some good practice of localizing variables. What does it do? Well, it wraps up that one line computation I did earlier with a little bit of robustness and a bit of point and click interface so that somebody can use this without having to know any code. Let's throw the code away. And now what we've got is a version of this that is defaulted to London, but now uses a second API to find all of the choices of APIs available to me. So I can go down this list and say, um, Antwerp, they're really into bicycles in Antwerp. Let's look at the current state of the bike system in Antwerp and is now used a different endpoint and updated the plot. So that kind of making things accessible by putting them on menus, that's an important step if you want other people to be able to engage in your work. Um, and our job is to try and automate that process to make that easier, including putting it onto a uh, on a website. So this cloud deploy, I encourage you to investigate when you, hopefully we will give a tutorial on deployment during the, the week, has allowed me to take that app and now uh, if I open that in a web browser, hopefully if I've done this right, I will get the same application, but it's now accessible through, through this web page on this URL that didn't exist and here's the same app now, but now public, did I make it public? Uh, permissions goes to public, yes. Yeah, so anyone in the world can use this now to see my geo plot of bike availability around the world. So we wanna make it so that don't just stop at the data science, um, uh, stop when you've got to a point where people can make use of it, whether that's interface and deployment or whether that's automation within the code that you've done, make sure that people can carry your work forward, otherwise it dies. And, and the clever work that you've done, the interesting bit, uh, in the end uh, becomes pointless if no one benefits from it. So that's, that's the um, end of my, my pitch to you today. The key message here is the tool set of computation is really huge. Um, the real challenge uh, through automation is not, shouldn't be the using it, that if we've done our job right, and I, you know, we haven't always 
than it as well as we could, but we try hard to make it so that all of these tools are as usable as possible uh, if you understand the concept. What you need to do, which we still haven't really solved, is to help, is to kind of broaden your horizons, spend some time browsing the, um, um, the, fun uh, the help system of Mathematica just to get a picture of what's out there, because that's usually the hard part. Once you know that there is uh, a function for finding the shortest uh, route across a graph, then looking up what the function name is and how to use it, that becomes really easy. But knowing that such functionality exists takes a bit of time just to just browse and look at the guide pages and just scan down the kind of functionality that's there and mull over if that could be applied to your data, what would it do? What would it tell you to be able to find the shortest route across a graph? If you could make a graph out of your data, what would a graph of your data mean? And what would a shortest route across that mean? And then it starts kind of giving you the insights that uh, things that you might be able to extract out by bringing the wider tool set. Um, and our role as humans is, is really to, if we can sit on automation and sit on this big corpus of computation is, is is still the very human task, even in the eight days of ChatGPT, of asking the interesting questions and interpreting the, the the output of all of this computation to say, what does it mean? And what does it tell me about what I should do? Those are still a human task at this point. Um, uh, but we want to leverage computation to actually do all of the chores to get there. <clears throat> 